uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, monthly webinar of the ERM Guide Heart. The topic of today is uh, Brugada syndrome. And I gave it this uh, subtitle uh, with a question mark, does this patient have uh, Brugada syndrome? And the patient is presented here. It is a 48 year old woman with hallucinations. She's scared and she has palpitations. And for that, she uses nortriptyline. She has an abnormal EKG. And for that, she was referred to an EP doctor. This was a case from the United States. And their Brugada syndrome was noted. The medication that she was using was stopped. The family history uh, might be significant. Her aunt died from sudden cardiac death at age 16, and a cousin at the same site died at age six. The, uh, we would like to do this interactive. So after this, a uh, few EKGs that will come now, I will have a question and uh, we request you to vote in the poll, and then I will discuss the voting results. So this is the EKG on nortriptyline. Um, the 12 leads are on top here, one, two, three, uh, AVR, AVL, and the precordial leads. V1 is up here, V2 is here, and this is a rhythm strip from V1, 2, and lead V5. Now the nortriptyline was stopped, and the baseline EKG is here. So in the same format, this is the baseline EKG without any medication. And this is on the normal precordial lead position. And this is one lead up, V1 and V2 are now in the third intercostal space. Uh, and so this is also an EKG without Brugada syndrome. So the question I would like to be answered is the following. Is this Brugada syndrome? And the options you have is yes, no or too early to tell. And now we give you a moment to vote. We will change the screen. Please take a moment and vote here. I don't see the result of the vote. I see that people are voting now. And then yeah. I see that the next question was already yeah. in, uh, in the screen as well. Uh, and I think there were some people a little later, so they couldn't okay. have they had time to see the ECGs. Um, you don't see the results no. at this moment. We have one person out of six who says this is Brugada syndrome and we have five persons who say this is too early to die. Okay. So the uh, just for those who uh, came in a little later, the story is here. 40 year old women um, known with hallucination, scared and palpitations and for that she was given nortriptyline by a psychiatrist. Uh, there was an abnormal EKG noted with referral uh, as an EP doc as a consequence. And this was that abnormal EKG on nortriptyline. That medication was stopped. And this is the baseline EKG without medication in the regular precordial lead position. And this is the third intercostal space for lead V1, V2. So the question was, is this Brugada syndrome? One of you thinks it is. The uh, five other voters uh, said it's too early to tell. Now the second question is what would you do here? Would you do genetic testing? Would you not do genetic testing? Would you do genetic testing plus implant an ICD? Or would you do an ICD implant only? Can you put up the vote? Yes, the vote was already um... That was already published, and we have some results, but I think it's only from the six participants yeah, who, okay. who answered earlier. I can try to share. The yeah, now I see the result, but this is the first question I see now here. Um, 
the, in the, the what would you do? Three, three participants um, would choose the genetic testing, two, no genetic testing, and one says genetic testing and an ICD implementation. Okay. So this is the result genetic testing was performed, and this is the result of genetic testing. So the Brugada syndrome panel was, MVT Brugada syndrome panel was performed. That includes all the genes that have been associated in the past with Brugada syndrome. And one of them is ABCC9. And in that particular gene, a variant of unknown significance was identified. Um, and the, um, well, the explanation of the company is here. Uh, we, we don't go through all of it, but it is referred to as a class three, which is a variant of unknown significance. So now the question is, of course, does this really help you? Um, so another opportunity to vote. Um, is this Brugada syndrome? Yes, no, or too early to tell? We, we have a difficulty with the voting system, so we are not going to run it again. Um, but I will come back to this uh, question um, later. So my personal view on this, this 40-year-old woman, uh, whether she has Brugada syndrome or not, I would vote for no. Um, be and because I think, if anything, this is drug-induced Brugada syndrome. Uh, and that are patients with a very low risk, particularly when they are asymptomatic. And you may even wonder whether the family history here is related. It is, of course, significant. A 16-year-old uh, aunt that died suddenly and a six-year-old cousin at the same side of the family. But uh, whether that relates to Bugada syndrome is, is definitely not sure. 16-year-old um, women dying from Bugada syndrome is extremely unusual. So I doubt whether this is related. So for me, this woman would be should not be treated for Brugada syndrome. I would not diagnose Brugada syndrome. I would avoid drugs <clears throat> because she responds to drugs in a way that you don't like. Uh, and I probably would avoid fever or treat fever at an early stage. And I will explain uh, this point of view during uh, my presentation. So let, let me go back to the definition of Brugada syndrome. And since Brugada syndrome was described first in 1996, uh, there have been a few different definitions for Brugada syndrome. So first, the diagnosis. The first consensus document on the diagnosis was this paper published in 2005. There was an earlier one in 2002, was the first consensus conference. And the second one is this in 2005. And here, the first attempt was to agree on the diagnosis. And the diagnosis requires a type one uh, pattern. You see here the precordial leads, V1 to V6, and you need this pattern with the arrow here. Uh, that is a, a clear type one pattern, uh, and that is uh, required for the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. The pattern here at the left, at the right side, is a type two pattern, and you have a type three pattern. They are um, not diagnostic for Brugada syndrome. And, and at, in those days, only when reverted, when converted to, into this type 1 pattern, Brugada syndrome was diagnosed. But in the early days, so this is a clear example, a 30-year-old male uh, who was resuscitated, who clearly has an abnormal EKG, ST segment elevation in the right precordial leads. Uh, and what you quite often also see is some minor conduction delay, PQ interval is a little wide, the axis, the ventricular axis is to the left, the QRS is a little broad, and that all fits with the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome and usually associates with a SCN5A loss of function variant. So in those days, in 2005, Brugada syndrome was considered, was to be considered with a type 1 EKG, plus or minus drugs, but you need, in addition to that, a documented episode of VF or self-terminating polymorphic VT, a family history of sudden cardiac death under the age of 45, a type 1 EKG in family members, um, EPS inducibility, syncope, or nocturnal agonal respiration as a sign of a cardiac arrest in the night. So 
one of these, in addition to type one EKG, only then Brugada syndrome should be considered. And the typical case would then be the 40 year old male, the example that I showed you with a positive family history for nocturnal sudden cardiac death with an EKG that might actually vary from day to day, which makes it complicated. Events usually occur at rest. Uh, patients are at risk during fever and occasionally also children are reported. Now in 2013, this consensus document from the Heart Rhythm Society, the European uh, Heart Rhythm Association and the Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm Society was published and it involved the diagnosis of and management of patients with inherited primary arrhythmia syndromes and Brugada syndrome was of course one of them. And at this point in time, we made it more liberal and we um, uh, um, accepted a diagnosis of Brugada syndrome when an ST segment elevation with a type one morphology was observed in either of the right precordial leads. So whether it was in the normal position, fourth intercostal space or in any of the higher positions, either spontaneously or after provocative drug testing. <coughs> So at this point in time, no further diagnostic criteria were required, only with an EKG with a type one, with or without provocative drug testing was considered sufficient to diagnose Brugada syndrome. And um, here Brugada syndrome is diagnosed in patients with a type two or type three ST segment elevation when a provocative drug test um, with one of the drugs, I will come to that later, induces a type one EKG. <clears throat> so bottom line for these recommendations in 2013 was one right precordial lead at any position with a type 1 morphology. The, the, the position of the leads um, is based on this particular study. This is from Mannheim in Germany from um, Martin Borgschever group who uh, clearly showed that the location of the type 1 EKG uh, correlates with the um, um, uh, with the position, anatomical position of the right ventricular outflow tract. This is, uh, this is examples from that particular paper. If the right ventricular outflow tract is right in the middle here, as in the right picture, and then the sternal lead, which we usually don't have, this would be lead V1, this would be lead V2, <coughs> would be the most positive. But if the if the uh, RVUT area is more to the left, then V1 is negative and V2 is positive. And the same holds for the vertical position. If the right ventricular outflow tract is higher than the fourth intercostal space, you will pick up the abnormal signals in the third intercostal space and in small people, even in the second intercostal space. And uh, a Japanese study actually showed that the diagnostic and the prognostic value of the type 1 EKG didn't really matter whether you were in the higher, the third or second intercostal space or in the, um, the regular intercostal space. So this is the standard group, this is the high group, and you can see that the prognosis free of cardiac events doesn't really matter, neither in all cases nor in the symptomatic cases. So this is the rationale of indicating that the position of the type 1 EKG doesn't really matter in terms for diagnosis and in terms of prognosis. The question was, however, whether the fact that drug-induced EKG was included as well, uh, that is something that many of us, I think, regret after the publication of that particular paper. And that led to this, what, what we refer to as the third consensus document, uh, the Shanghai, which was um, made in a meeting in Shanghai, where uh, again, we try to come up with a, um, a, a new diagnostic uh, scheme. And that was put forward um, like the long QT syndrome score, the Schwartz score, which is a point score. And we tried to set up here um, a point score for Bugara syndrome. And here at the bottom, you can see that the score for a positive uh, diagnosis or for the diagnosis of Bugara syndrome requires at least one EKG finding. Uh, and if you had uh, 3.5 points or more, you had a probable or definite Brugada syndrome. If the score is between two and three, it's possible Brugada syndrome, and if it's less than two, it's non-diagnostic. Uh, 
So a patient with a spontaneous type 1 Brugada EKG ends up with 3.5 points, and that is sufficient for, the di for a probable or definite diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. However, a patient with a type 2 or 3 Brugada pattern that converts with, positive, uh, with provocative drug testing only gets two points. So there, the patient needs additional criteria, and that can be, for example, an unexplained cardiac arrest or a documented VF episode that gives you another three points. And then together, you have five points, which is sufficient for the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. And any of these other um, parameters or criteria at points and, and well, in, in different combinations, you can reach the diagnosis Brugada syndrome. Now, if we think about the substrate of Brugada syndrome, I think we all agree that this particular paper from Dr. Nanamani in Bangkok is uh, uh, essential for that. And he demonstrated that at the right ventricular epicardial layer of the right ventricular outro tract, so the, the outside of the heart of the right ventricular outro tract shows very abnormal signals. This is um, a mapping uh, from that particular area. And in that area, you see very abnormal, low fractionated, low amplitude signals with long delay. Um, and that is the area that if you ablate that particular area, you will get rid of the substrate and the patient will get rid of the arrhythmias. So the substrate of Bulgaria's, Bulgaria syndrome is in the epicardial layer of the right ventricular outro tract. Here's another map. This is the uh, pulmonalis. Uh, artery. So this is the right ventricle. And just below the pulmonary valve is that area with abnormal signals, as you can see here on the top. And if you go down to the left, you can see the abnormal signals. But if you go further from the area of the, of the uh, pulmonary valve, the signals becomes more normal. This is a normal signal and a, and a late potential. <clears throat> but down at the right ventricle or at the left ventricle, the signals are completely normal. So the abnormal signals are to be found in the epicardial layers of the right ventricular outflow tract. This is from uh, uh, another patient where mapping has been done at the right ventricular epicardial site and at the same time at the right ventricular endocardial site. You can see that only at the epicardial site there are abnormal signals and at the endocardial site signals are completely normal. And interestingly enough, before ablation, you have the type 1 EKG. After ablation, the type 1 EKG is gone. There is some injury current here, but later on, later in time, days, weeks later, the EKG is completely normal. And you can no longer find a Brugada type 1 pattern, not even after aspirin testing. And the patients are free of arrhythmias. So at this point, it was concluded that at the epicardium of the right ventricular outflow tract, there are late to very late potentials and low voltage signals, and ablation of these signals normalizes the EKG and prevent future arrhythmias. <clears throat> now, many other um, colleagues uh, went to study this. This is early data from Bordeaux, <clears throat> where they um, mapped the area with uh, during Ashmolin testing. And this is what you see on the baseline EKG. So the T node before uh, Ashmolin is here is clearly abnormal, but the ST segment starts to rise uh, upon addition of Ashmolin. Uh, and if you then look at the epicardial mapping signals, so these are the epicardial mapping si signals, then during Ashmolin, you see that the uh, epicardial signals become more pronounced, that the activation delay becomes uh, more pronounced and the signals are more low uh, amplitude. And this is at the different mapping sites uh, equally visualized. Dr. <coughs> Dr. <coughs> Papona in uh, Milan did uh, larger studies. This is one of his first publications on 135 Brugada syndrome patients. Um, he also included here patients um, with a drug-induced EKG. 31 here had a spontaneous type EKG, and 39 had a history of VF or syncope. So that means that the majority of patients was actually asymptomatic. He performed ablation in these patients, and he did it in a very structural way by uh, giving all these patients Ashmalin and repeat the uh, mapping uh, during Ashmalin. So this is the area with abnormal signals at baseline. And this is the area during uh, Ashmalin. It becomes much larger, and you see that these signals are, are very um, abnormal here. Um, so in the summary of this 
a study was that flaconite extends the low fractionated voltage epicardial area from 19 square centimeters to 27. And ashmaline uh, was also used here and it also extended the low fractionated voltage epicardial areas more in male than in females and more in symptomatic patients than in asymptomatic patients. Papona went on uh, in a rapid way. He studied many more patients as a, as a year later, 191 Brugada syndrome patients, 41 with spontaneous type 1, and 88 with a history of VF. And here he studied the different clinical and electrophysiological characteristics and, and, and looked what the um, difference uh, between these patients was. And actually the only, um, the only real um, um, parameter that was related to risk was the size of the substrate. You can see the p-value was very low. So whether SCN5A variant was present, the clinical presentation, at that spontaneous type one, that all this did not matter for the risk. The only risk, the risk was determined by the substrate size uh, with a clear, um, and this is the Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, sorry, the uh, um, sensitivity versus specificity curve for this particular study. And if, if there was a, an area of more than four square centimeters, the patient was at high risk for future events. So the conclusion for, as to the substrate is that at the epicardium of the right ventricular area, there are late to very late potentials and low voltage uh, signals. Um, with a spontaneous type one EKG, there is a larger substrate. <clears throat> Symptomatic patients have a larger substrate and a larger substrate means easier inducibility. Now, what is the difference between a drug-induced and a spontaneous type one EKG? Now, there are two issues important here. The first is that a normal baseline EKG does not preclude the presence of a significant substrate. That's also what Papona showed. There are patients who, that, who presented with VF and have a normal baseline EKG, but an abnormal EKG during ashmaline. So a normal baseline EKG, you can still have a significant substrate. But it, at the other hand, it's for sure that patients with a normal baseline EKG and only a drug-induced EKG carry a much better prognosis. <clears throat> and these data come from this, um, this um, uh, summary, this review that will uh, soon be published in, um, in the European Heart Journal. This is on asymptomatic uh, patients. Uh, and this is on symptomatic patients. In blue, you see the drug-induced type 1 EKG. In red, you see the spontaneous type 1 EKG. And you can see that the risk for a spontaneous type 1 EKG is almost fourfold the risk of a, or threefold the risk of a, a, a drug induced EKG. In asymptomatic patients and in symptomatic patients, um, it is a similar um, comparison 1.3% <clears throat> for um, symptomatic drug induced EKG and 4.8% for a spontaneous type EKG. So patients with a drug induced EKG are less at risk than patients with a spontaneous type 1 EKG. Now, which drugs are used for the sodium channel blocking test? Um, ashmaline, flaconite, uh, intravenous, and in countries where flaconite IV is not available, it's also done by oral, that's particularly in South America. Prokinamide in the US and Canada, and pilziconite is, is typically used in Japan. <clears throat> and the Sensitivity and the specificity of the test is not so easy to study. Um, but uh, by using different, so, and that is because there is no real gold standard. Now, if we accept as a gold standard the presence of an SCN5A variant, then the literature uh, tells us that the sensitivity of the test for ashmaline is in the range of 80%, and for flaconite, it's similar. If we use patients with an intermittent type 1 EKG, so a patient that shows up one day with a type 1 EKG and another day without a type 1 EKG, and if you do at that point in time an ashmaline test, the sensitivity is 100%, uh, and for flaconite is 70%. An obligate carrier ship, that is a story from Nantes and France, elegant study where the, uh, a patient in between two definite carriers was studied, and also here there's 100% sensitivity. And for flaconite, it's, it's in that same range. So based on these um, data, I think it can safely be concluded that the sensitivity of the test is pretty good for ashmaline, less so for flaconite, 
but very good for uh, ashmaline, and that means that you can safely exclude Brugada syndrome. So a negative ashmaline test means probably means that you don't have Brugada syndrome. Now, what about the specificity of the test? This is the yield of a sodium channel blocking test in three control populations. One is 66 patients large, one is 84 patients large, and one is 46 patients. And the, the yield is in the range between 5% and 0% in this last study. And there are different patient groups that have been studied with an Ashmaline test, ARVC here at the left, um, ARVC uh, here, AV node reentrant tachycardia, AV, AV reentrant tachycardia, Chagas disease, and um, uh, myotonia, myotonia dystrophia in two different populations. And the yield of the sodium channel blocking test is in this range. And that is quite some concern. So, for example, in this AV node reentrant population, almost 30% of individuals have a positive Ashmaline test. <clears throat> and com in comparison, it was 5% in the control population. Also, myotonia dystrophia, uh, morbus steinert, the yield was pretty high. And even in ARVC and in AVRT, the yield is in the range of 16%. So that led, and one of these studies was accompanied by this um, editorial from Sami Viskin uh, and myself, where we use the title, Everybody Has Brugada Syndrome Until Proven. Otherwise, and that is based on the on, on, on these data that the specificity simply seems to be rather poor. Um, and that either means that the test cannot be trusted, or you have to accept that 30% of your AV nodal oriented tachycardia patients has Brugada syndrome, 16% of WPW patients has Brugada syndrome, and maybe even 4 to 5% of the control population. Now that led us to this following uh, proposal, and this is in the same paper that will be in the European Heart Journal uh, soon, that if you have a spontaneous lead one EKG, uh, like indicated here, then the diagnosis Brugada syndrome can be made, and the risk for all comers, so asymptomatic plus symptomatic patients together, is in this range, up to 3% per year. And for asymptomatic patients, it's a lot uh, lower. This is uh, all comers. So this is this. And, but if the baseline EKG is converted into type 1 EKG with a drug, then we don't believe anymore that that is identical to Brugada syndrome. The substrate then is apparently present, and we refer to that as a reduced conduction reserve in the RVOT. And the risk, as I mentioned before, is significantly layer. Now, the question is, of course, how much of this group is actually Brugada syndrome? Um, and that, we believe, depends on the indication for the test. So if you do it in a control population, <clears throat> not that many people will have Brugada syndrome. But if you do it in family members of a patient with Brugada syndrome, the a priori likelihood that the patient has Brugada syndrome is already 50%. So if you then clearly convert into type 1, um, it might actually be quite significant, the number of patients that do have Brugada syndrome. And if you do it in a patient that just has an unexplained syncope, um, it, it is identically um, more likely that you have Brugada syndrome than, than you do within a control individual. So this question is crucial. And um, in, in the um, indication for the test is important here. If you're testing family members of Brugada syndrome, maybe even up to 90 or 95% of patients actually do have Brugada syndrome. Uh, but if you test the patient random, then the, the, the chance that you have Brugada syndrome is very low. Now that leads me to the following conclusion that Brugada syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. It does require a spontaneous type 1 EKG and a drug-induced EKG does not equal Brugada syndrome. And I also believe that we should actually stop with uh, genetic testing in these patients. So that, that explains my answers to the case that I showed. I don't have the case again in the presentation. But the case is a clear uh, drug-induced type 1 EKG. Uh, there is a family history, but the family history is questionable as to, re to the relation to Brugada syndrome. Uh, and I don't think genetic testing helps you here. And I also don't believe that a patient, a symptomatic patient, 
does require an ICD. Um, and with that, um, I conclude, and I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions might there be. So we will use the chat for that, I assume. Um, I okay. have one question in the chat. Um, I think it was from part from the beginning from the presentation. And Andre asks if the uh, Shanghai score is even applied to children without restriction. Yeah, we, we do believe so that the Shanghai score can also be used in children when you're really interested in the type one pattern. What you more often see in children is significant conduction disease and not the type one pattern. These patients do require the same precaution, so no no drugs, uh, be careful with fever. Uh, but I think you still need a type 1 EKG before you diagnose Pulgara syndrome. So Thomas asked, would you perform genetic testing in ashmaline induced Pulgara type 1 EKG with baseline conduction disease? Yeah, that is that is a good question. That That is, of course, a different situation than in a baseline normal EKG. So if there's clear conduction disease at every level, so wide PR, wide QRS, abnormal axis, and the ashmaline test is positive, I, I would be careful doing an ashmaline test, actually, to start with. Um, so you might even consider genetic testing before doing the ashmaline test. And then if you find an SCN5A loss of function variant, I don't see any reason to do the ashmaline test because the precautions will be similar with or without a drug-induced EKG. And fortunately, Thomas agrees. <laughs> How is the myocardial substrate in these patients? So, Elena, that is not an easy to answer question. There have been biopsies taken from these areas. Uh, Dr. Nadamani has had some open chest cases, so patients where he could not reach the pericardial space because of previous surgery or previous uh, accident with, with uh, damage of the thorax. And if you then take a biopsy at the area where you really measure, where you really find these delayed potentials, then you do see fibrosis in that particular area. Dr. Beer in the UK has done uh, with, with um, uh, Mary Shepard, has done uh, pathology studies in, in patients uh, in whose families Brugada syndrome was diagnosed. And then you assume that the patient died from Bugatti syndrome. And there you find a very similar substrate. You find uh, heavy, heavy fibrosis in the epicardial layer only of the right ventricular artery tract. Um, so the next question is, do you see AV block with prolonged syncope in children with Bugatti syndrome? In that case, would you only implant the pacemaker in absence of PT? Yeah, so... Um, if I, I haven't seen those cases myself, but I have seen cases with prolonged conduction disease, and that includes short, that includes AV block, but not, not 30 seconds. Uh, but I think you can use uh, a pacemaker in those cases only and not um, uh, immediately proceed with an, with an ICD. If there is no type 1 EKG, I think the risk for ventricular arrhythmias is less than. Um, if you have um, uh, type 1 EKG. Yeah, so Stefan asks, uh, do you recommend a wide range of Bugatti genes or focus SCN5A genotyping in a routine testing? Uh, Stefan, we have completely moved to SCN5A only um, because the all the other genes only give you um, noise, um, VOSs, and genes that we do not consider to be strongly associated with Bugatti syndrome uh, anymore. So we we have converted only to SCN5A only. Yeah, so another interesting question is these patients can have fast vagal syncope and it's difficult to distinguish between a real vasovagal and Brugada. Um, that is true, but the, the 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 phase of vagal syncope tends still tends to have these very typical triggers. So if you 
if you if, if the, the the history taking suggests phasal phagal syncope we accept it as phagal phagal syncope and occasionally we still do a tilt table test if we are not 100 percent sure and but in the cases that i've seen myself the tilt table test uh, then recapitulates the event uh, and then the patient says this is what i recognize and then we are completely convinced convinced that this is vasovagal and not an arrhythmia <clears throat> the tricky part is that these patients are indeed at risk also during vagal stimuli so then the st segment elevation may actually become worse and and the patient may be more at risk with with um, with these phasal phagal syncope. That is prob probably the reason that they are at risk after a heavy meal when you have this phasal phagal uh, input. There's another question from Aslan, maybe? No. Oh, I miss it. Sorry, Anton. Mm -hmm. um, what are your recommendations, fever drugs in asymptomatic patients with only a positive Eichmann test? if you consider that they do not have a Brugada syndrome. Yeah, so I, I do think they have a substrate. And for that reason, I would recommend them to avoid the relevant drugs and maybe, and then we advise them to make a EKG during fever. So I'm not saying they don't have, they, they do not, they do have nothing. They have a substrate in the right ventricular outflow tract, which makes them vulnerable for these drugs. And in the presence of these drugs and an abnormal EKG, you might still be at risk. It also depends a little bit on the age. The, uh, the, if fibrosis is really a key element in the RVOT area, then aging might contribute to more fibrosis. And that is not at the very old age, but that can even be between 20 and 40 and particularly in males. Um, so patient with, um, with a positive Ashmanin test, if you still have that result, we, we still take the same precautions as to fever and drugs. And we ask them to come back five years later and just to see whether they don't develop a spontaneous type 1 EKG over time. <clears throat> um, in spontaneous or fever-induced type 1 pattern without evidence of VT in children, we abstain from ICD. Would you agree? Um, yeah, we are very conservative with, um, with um, ICDs too, and particularly in children. Um, spontane also, a spontaneous type 1 pattern does not immediately lead to ICD implant. Uh, but you have to be very careful with these triggers and particularly fever in children is obviously one of these issues that that uh, might be relevant. So we, we are careful with them, but we do not implant an ICD. And then the question from Stefan about kinidine in these children, um, that's not only in children, but kinidine can also be used in children. So there's particularly uh, experience with kinidine in Israel and in, in Nantes also, and they also children have been treated with kinidine successfully. So kinidine can be used also in children and is a very protective drug in Brugada syndrome. So the, the problem is how to get it. You cannot get it everywhere. Um, and the second problem is that it is sometimes actually quite often uh, associated with side effects. That is that it can be a reason not to you can cannot dose high. You might not need a very high dose either. So, but kinidine should probably be more be used more often. Yeah, the ablate RVUT um, early to avoid ICD. That is a very relevant question. We have speculated in another editorial that at the point in time in the future, it will be like WPW syndrome, where you ablate the substrate, you get rid of the substrate and you don't have to implant an ICD. Uh, that is probably gonna happen but uh, in the future, but you have to realize that ablating the RVUT epicardial area requires specific skills. Uh, and in the lab, as, as that from Papona, where he's obviously extremely skilled and no complications are made, but in a lab with less skill, that you will have uh, complications. And so you really need to be sure how well you can do it. 
before you start to do it. And I think we need a trial, a prospective trial to prove that it is effective in asymptomatic individuals. In symptomatic individuals, it's, it's no, no big deal anymore. We do it, everybody does it. But in asymptomatic individuals, as a, as a, as a prophylactic treatment, I think we need a prophylactic trial to show that the side effects balance the, the profit for the patients. Yeah, Antoine, I, I, would you recommend quinidine in asymptomatic children with a spontaneous type 1 EKG without history or family sudden cardiac death? That is, that is a difficult question. Uh, I, th I think with a spontaneous type 1 EKG, you are probably at risk. The risk is at least in the range of 1%, uh, and, and that may require quinidine. We haven't done it always. We follow these patients carefully. We are very strict on the on the triggers. I think if you really get rid of the triggers, so fever and, and the drugs, the drugs in children may not be a big issue, but fever definitely is, then you probably don't need the ICD and you don't need quinidine. If the, there are some, the, the whether you can identify patients at, at higher risk with a spontaneous type one EKG, there are some markers like a fractionation already present on the baseline EKG, like spontaneous variation in the ST segment amplitude um, that are markers of higher risk and these patients might be might have to be treated. Okay, we are Almost that, that is one more question. In, in children with family history of Brugada syndrome, but with negative phenotype, our custom is to ask the children come to the hospital during fever to take EKG. Yeah, so the question is, should they come every time they have fever? We, we ask them to come back uh, when the temperature is higher than the previous time. So if the temperature was 38 and the EKG did not change, we only ask them to come back when the temperature is higher than that, so 39 or 40. And then, if it is, if it's still normal, um, I think they are safe. But in a, in a few years later, you might have to ask them to come back because the the substrate changes. So if the EKG was normal during thirty nine degrees in two thousand eighteen, then then I would still ask the patient to come back into two thousand twenty three with the same level. <clears throat> and when they grow up, we do an Ashmolene test. If the Ashmolene test is negative, we stop ask them to come to the um, to the hospital. So I uh, doing an Ashmolene test, we haven't discussed an Ashmolene test at very young age is is and it's negative doesn't tell you anything because that might change over time. Um, yeah, Stefan, that is the question I have no answer. What is the current understanding how SCN5A loss of function variance leads to focal fibrosis? I don't know. I, I don't know why it's only there or it probably not only there, it's probably also at different areas, but that is the area where it leads to an arrhythmic substrate earliest. Um, you can also see some minor changes in the left ventricle, uh, but the but the right ventricular outflow tract is, is particularly um, relevant for arrhythmias. And, but I don't know why it, it's, mouse models have a similar response to, if you make a mouse model, a knockout mouse for, for SCN5A, um, haplotype insufficient, uh, several models. They also have fibrosis uh, throughout the heart, but also in the RBOT. But the mechani me mechanism isn't known. Yeah, and the children, the age of doing the Ashmolene test, we do it uh, after puberty, I think. Uh, the um, and, and then you can even wait until they are at adult age so that the adult cardiologist uh, can do it. And so from age 16 onward would be very reasonable, I, I think. Okay, so with that, I think we come to an end. Um, I wish you all a nice day and hope to see you next month. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.